true. Nervous. Very, very dreadfully nervous I had been, and am. But why will you say that I'm mad? The disease had sharpened my senses, not destroyed, not dulled them. Above all was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How, then, am I mad? Arkin, and observe how healthily, how calmly, I can tell you the whole story. It's impossible to say how the idea first entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object? There was none. Passion? There was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me, never given me insult. For his gold I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. He had the eye of a vulture, a pale blue eye with a thin film over it. Whenever that eye fell upon me, my blood ran cold. So by degrees, very gradually, I made up my mind to take the life of the old man. And thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded. With what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door and opened it. Oh, so gently. And then, when I had made an opening sufficient for my head, I put in a dark lantern, all closed, closed that no light shone out, and then thrust in my head. You would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved it very, very slowly so as I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the room so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. Would a madman have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was well within the room, I undid the lantern cautiously. Oh, so cautiously. Cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights. Every night, just at midnight. But I found the eye always closed, and so it was impossible to do the work, for it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning when day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he had passed the night. So you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night, just at twelve, I looked in upon him as he slept. Upon the eighth night, I was more than unusually cautious in opening the door. A watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the full extent of my power. I mean, to think, there I was, opening the door little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me, for he moved on the bed suddenly as if startled. Now you may think I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch with a thick darkness, and so I knew he could not see the opening of the door, and so I kept pushing it on steadily, steadily. I had my head in now, and was about to undo the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening and the old man sprang up in bed crying out, Who's there? I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour, I did not move a muscle. And in the meantime, I did not hear him lie back down. He was still sitting up in bed, listening, just as I have done night after night. Presently, I heard a slight groan, and I knew that it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or of grief, oh no. It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of one's soul when overcharged with awe. Many a night, just at midnight when all the world has slept, it has arisen from my own bosom, 
deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I knew what the old man felt, and I pitied him, although I fairly chuckled at heart. I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first noise when he had turned in the bed. His fears had been growing upon him ever since. He'd been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He'd been saying, Oh, it's nothing but the wind in the chimney. It's a mouse crossing the floor. It is merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. Yes, he'd been trying to calm himself with these suppositions, but it found it all in vain. All in vain. Because death in approaching him had stalked with his dark shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of this unperceived shadow that caused him to feel, though he neither saw nor heard, but to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open a little, a very little crevice in the lantern. And so I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at length a single dim ray like the thread of a spider shot from out of the crevice and fell upon the vulture eye. It was open, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I could see it with perfect distinctiveness, all dull blue with a hideous veil that chilled the very marrow of my bones. Yet I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person. I had directed, as if by instinct, the ray precisely upon the damned spot. And have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over-acuteness of sense? Now I say there came to my ears a low, dull, quick sound, such as a, a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound, too. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury, as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier to courage. But even yet I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. I tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder, I say, louder every moment. I have told you that I am nervous, and so I am. And now, in that dead hour of night, in the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. And now a new anxiety seized me. The noise would be heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell, I threw open the door and I leaped into the room. He shrieked once, only once. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over top of him. I then smiled gaily to have the deed so far done. Yet for many minutes more, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length it ceased. The old man was dead. I removed the bed and examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there for several minutes. There was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me no more. If you still think me mad, you will do so no longer when I tell you of the wise precautions I took for concealment of the body. The night waned and I worked hastily but in silence. First, I dismembered the corpse. I cut off the head, the arms, and the legs. I then took up three boards from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the boards so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatsoever. I had been too wary for that. A tub had caught it all. When I had made an end to these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. And as the bells sounded the hour, there came a knocking on the street door. Now I went down to open it with a light heart. For what had I now to fear? And there entered three men who introduced themselves with perfect suavite as officers of the police. 
A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicion of foul play had been aroused, information lodged at the police office, and they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled. For what had I to fear? I bade the gentleman welcome. The shriek, I said, was my own in a dream. The old man, I explained, was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search, search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed. And in the enthusiasm of my confidence, I brought chairs into the room and desired them here to rest from their fatigues. While in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, I placed my own seat upon the very spot with which beneath reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat, and while I answered cheerily, they chattered of familiar things. But ere at long I find myself growing pale, and I wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears. But still they sat and chatted. The noise continued and became more distinct. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definitiveness, until at length I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt I now grow very pale. But I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice, but the noise steadily increased. And what could I do? It, it was a low, dull, quick sound, such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, uh, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I arose, and I argued about trifles in a high key with violent gesticulation, but the noise steadily increased. Oh, why would they not be gone? I paced to and fro with heavy strides as if excited to fury by the observations of the men, but the noise steadily increased. Oh, God, what could I do? I foamed. I raved. I swore. I swung the chair on which I had been sitting and grated it on the boards. But the noise arose over all and continually increased. And still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard not? Almighty oh, God, no. No, they heard. They suspected. They knew. They were making a mockery of my horror. This I thought and this I think that anything was better than this agony anything was more tolerable than this derision I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer I felt I must scream or die louder villains dissemble no more I admit the deed tear up the planks here here it is the beating of his hideous heart ha <laughs> ha